Well, I want to welcome to the program, Father John Ricardo. Father John, you are willing to come back into the room, back into the battle of uh, like, let's answer questions live without knowing what they are. Thank you so much for being willing to do that. Uh, happily, Thomas. And uh, it's not a battle. It's uh, it's an opportunity to let the Holy Spirit just kind of shed light on whatever it is. Hopefully he can shed light on. See, I'm even sure that. You just see. Yeah, but you I'll even do. started. I like that. You started. You did, did, Let's take the word battle and maybe wrestling, right? It's uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel. Let's get to some insight. Let's get to something new here. So let's do some uh, Let's do some wrestling. Okay, so we are starting. We're having this interview on the uh, solemnity of the most sacred heart of Jesus. Okay, so opening question. God is outside of time. Time lives in God. God doesn't live in time. Christ died 2,000 years ago for the sins of all time, for before and after him. So what happened 2,000 years ago impacts us. Great. We get that. Well, what about the theological insight that we impact Christ, that how we live today impacts what happened to Jesus in his passion, death, and resurrection? So on the solemnity of the Sacred Heart, we've probably had some reflections on the idea that we impact Jesus through our sins. The catechism quotes uh, this insight that, uh, or the catechism states that uh, through our sins, we are the ministers and authors of all that Christ suffered in his passion and death. But what about our expressions of love? Our expressions of love can also impact what Jesus endured in his passion. And on this feast day, I'm thinking of Pope Pius XI wrote an encyclical on the Sacred Heart of Jesus, where he talks about the ministry of the angel in the agony of the garden and how we can join that angel in the mission of consoling Christ. So I'd love for you to reflect on this insight that how we live today impacts in a beautiful way or a horrific way what Christ endured in his passion. You just gave the answer I would give. So that letter is, is a particularly favorite letter of mine. So I say two things, maybe. So the first is to make sure that we understand the passion um, more fully than perhaps most of us do. Meaning what? Meaning Jesus and his passion is by all means making atonement for our sins. So, I mean, he's hanging right behind me. He's also um, revealing to us the Father and who the Father is and who the Father is is love. So when you look at the cross, you don't see um, anything so much as you see the love of God. But the thing that most people don't take into account, I find, and which has been so transformative for me, is to keep in mind, so the, the one who's hanging on the cross behind me um, is the one who made the universe. And the universe is 90 plus billion light years across. And you can't nail him to a cross. Like Jesus, so we use the language like Jesus is a victim. Well, that's true, but it's also not true. Jesus, nothing on the cross is happening to him. Jesus is the one who's always in control. And I think the thing we have to keep in mind to balance what you're saying or, or putting forth is um, the other thing that the Lord is doing on the cross is he's going to battle. That's the that's the real battle. And he's going to battle against the one who's bound the human race from whom we cannot escape. And he does it in an extraordinarily clever way. And he does it by hiding in flesh. So Satan is deceived on the cross into thinking that um, he's going to capture this man like he's captured every other man since Adam's rebellion or, or falling for the first deception. But in fact, what Jesus is doing on the cross is, yes, making atonement and yes, revealing the Father's love. But he's also, he's something like a Trojan horse, which is kind of a favorite image of the fathers of the church. They don't use that language. They might use fish hook or mousetrap or something like that. He, he's He's trying to... Um, get into the strong man's house so as to liberate us. That, that's just really important to keep in mind. I think as we start talking about 
how he's making atonement and how we can console him. Otherwise, you get an image of Jesus, like Jesus is, you know, somehow lost his superpowers on, you know, Holy Thursday night and Good Friday, and then they suddenly come back on Easter Sunday. But but the Good Friday is not a defeat. The, the cross is a victory. It's not a defeat. And Easter Sunday is a confirmation of that. Now, that said, let's go to your question. I, I find that passage in um, in the Holy Father's writings about consoling his heart or, or kind of like stepping into the ministry of the angel to be an amazing um, thing to reflect on. I don't know, understand how that works quite candidly, but I, I do find it a helpful way to pray to say, okay, so uh, Jeremy Driscoll who's the abbot at Mount Angel in uh, Mount Angel, Oregon. I heard him say one time that the Lord on the cross and in his passion, so the, the whole Paschal mystery is something like a car slamming on its brakes. And so if you watch a car slam on its brakes in slow motion, the first thing it does is it lurches forward and then it rocks backwards and then it comes to a standstill. And he says, that's what Jesus is doing in his passion. Like he, he lurches forward and he grabs all the sins of all of humanity that's going to live after him and he pulls them to himself and then he lurches backwards and he grabs all the sins of everybody since adam and he pulls them to himself and then he comes to a standstill like this because he's he's the god man and so if that's what's happening in the passion and the passion begins in gethsemane then um when I pray sometimes, I just pray, Lord, bring me, or Holy Spirit, bring me into the garden. Because I know I know he's absorbed my sin into himself in his scourging and in his being nailed to the cross and in his crowning with thorns. But let me right now somehow be a means by which I can comfort him, not just torment him, or not just be a means by which he's suffering, I should say. Um, but be a means by which I can comfort him and tell him now um, how much I love him and how sorry I am. And to be there on behalf of those, you know, it's kind of like the prayer that the angel teaches the children at Fatima. You know, um, uh, I love, I adore, you know, I, and I ask forgiveness for those who do not love and who do not adore. So, Lord, on behalf of all those who ignore you, who take for granted the gift of life, who trample on the cross, um, I'm here. So somehow, Lord, I pray that my love is weak and pathetic as it is and fickle as it is at this moment in time is a, is a comfort to you. I don't know how to think of it other than that. That's very beautiful, Father John. I love how you, you're you drawing out the, let's call it the paradoxical aspect of, of the truths of our faith, that we have to uphold two elements at the same time in order to understand either one correctly. You're talking about Christ crucified as a confession of the sins of the world and a confession of the love of the Lord. It's both simultaneously. And so being in the garden in both ways, simultaneously saying, Lord, I'm so sorry, but Lord, I love you. Uh, is this powerful mystery. I'm going to talk about that. The truths of our faith are mysterious. They overflow our capacity uh, and they overflow any concept, the capacity to express fully the reality we're talking about. So let's take a look at two, um, two elements of our life of faith, who Jesus is and who the church is. And so as we orbit around Christ Jesus, the Son of God, there are different entry points, and those are often referred to as the titles of Jesus. So as you are orbiting around, as you are relating to Christ through the various modes by which he's relating to you, is there one or other that you have found so helpful to help you in your life of faith or to help you in your ministry of helping Catholics come alive? So Jesus is Lord, Savior, Shepherd, divine physician, prince of peace? Is there a particular entry point into who Christ intends to be in the lives in your life or the lives of the faithful that you feel like, you know, we, we need to explore and enter into Christ more fully through that title? Um, 
it changes. So let me find you a, a quote really quick. But it, so it, it varies, you know, from time to time. But um, much of the time, and including like right now, <laughs> um, what I think is most um, encouraging to me is the title Goel. So um, in the um, in the book of Isaiah, um, let me find this for you real quick. This is the joy of um, you take your time. Not Father, knowing great. What you're gonna <laughs> um, so it's Isaiah forty nine. So um, the Lord says, um, let me pull up this whole passage. So in in order to get this again, you, uh, let me let me just set this up if I can because I don't think I, my experience increasingly so over the last few years is we don't know this part of the gospel. We we don't know what what I would call the bad news, and because we don't know the bad news, we don't find the gospel to be all that extraordinary. And I think most people so most people I think see Jesus. Well, we all see Jesus incompletely. Most people see Jesus, um, especially most men, in an almost emasculated way, mainly because of the passion. So I think most people have an image of Jesus that's something like this. Jesus is kind, and he's gentle, and he's compassionate, and he's patient, and he plays with kittens. And all those things are true, even the kitten part, right? Because he made the kittens. Um, but what it fails to take into account is the simple reality that Jesus is Lord. And to say Jesus is Lord is not the ending of a prayer. It's a reality. And it means nobody else is. And what lords do is they rule. And right now he has in his hands all the kings of the earth, all the presidents of the earth, all the governors of the earth, and all of creation. And he's not nervous, and he's not anxious, and he's not weak. And we need to reclaim that, I think, seriously. And in order to understand why he has come, like, why does God become man? We have to understand, well, why does man need help? And the reason for that, um, which is, you know, the bad news, is because uh, humanity is, is enslaved. And we're enslaved to, to powers we can't compete against, namely sin, death, and hell, and Satan, who was a good angel who rebels against God out of envy of you and me, which is really significant. I'm not sure how much. Have you seen Nefarious? I have not. So it's always leery. I'm always leery to promote things, but um, I think Nefarious is extraordinary. I, I would suggest it's the kerygma told from the other side. Hmm. And it's very powerful. And we don't like to talk about, especially as Americans, like we don't like to talk about bad things and we don't like to get stuck there. But again, I, I have no understanding of why I should get on my knees and surrender my life to Jesus unless I know what he's done. And what he's done is more than just atone for my sins. What he's done is he's rescued me from powers I can't escape. You're going to die, I'm going to die, and there's nothing you can do to stop it. Nothing. And if you've ever been at the bedside, any of us listening, uh, of the uh, someone that you love who's dying, you've never felt more impotent. Because I can't stop it. My mom got cold from the feet up. It was horrific to watch. It was taking her. And didn't matter the medical care we had or the money we had, I couldn't stop it. And I've never felt weaker in my life. And death's not supposed to be here. It's a power. That's how Paul talks about it, especially in Romans. Sin is also a power. So sin isn't just something that I do, although it is. It's also something that exerts control over me. That's why, you know, think for 10 seconds. Have you ever done anything that you didn't want to do? that you knew you shouldn't do, that you hated doing and you did anyway? And of course, the answer for all of us is yes. And that makes absolutely no sense. Why would I do something that I know I shouldn't do, I don't want to do, and I hate? Well, it's because sin's a power. 
Well, how did we get there? Well, we got there because this creature who was an angel who rebels out of envy deceives our first parents. And the result of the fall is not simply that we rebelled against God. It's that we sold ourselves into slavery. And there's no way out. That's the situation of the human race. Like you and I are in the hands of a fiend who traffics humanity far worse than any human trafficker on this planet. That's to set up how I see Jesus and my favorite way of thinking of him. So in Isaiah 49, God says this. He says, can the prey be taken from the mighty? Who's the prey? Us, you and me. Who's the mighty? Satan. Or the captives of a tyrant be rescued. Who's the captives? Us. Who's the tyrant? Satan. Thus says the Lord, which is, which is like, listen up, people. Even the captives of the mighty shall be taken, and the prey of the tyrant shall be rescued. Why? Not because I'm going to send an angel. Not because I'm going to wave a magic wand. Because I, God says, will contend with those who contend with you. In other words, I am going to fight for you. And he goes on to say, then all flesh shall know that I am the Lord, your Savior, your Redeemer, the mighty one of Jacob. And the word that's used there, your Redeemer, is in Hebrew the word goel. And a goel is somebody who acts as the next of kin. And a goel in the Old Testament has a lot of roles, but especially two. If, if somebody in my family is sold into slavery, it's the goel's role to go get them out of slavery. Or if someone's been murdered, it's the goel's goal and, and role to avenge the murder. The creator of the universe says, that's who you are to me. You're my next of kin, and I will rescue you from slavery, and I will avenge the murder of this race, which I made in my own image and likeness, and I will do it by becoming a man and hiding myself as a man so as to entrap this enemy so that you will go free. So when Jesus says in the Gospels, when a strong man guards his palace, his possessions are safe. The strong man is Satan. The palace is the world. His possessions are us. But Jesus says, but when one stronger than he attacks him and overcomes him, then his possessions go free. That's who Jesus is to me. Jesus is the stronger one. That's beautiful. Father, Father John, I'm talking with Father John Ricardo today and uh, just having this live dialogue, this live conversation, bringing these interesting questions. Uh, it's a very powerful insight. And this actually gets me to move further down my list of questions. So you and I, we uh, attended the same major seminary for several years, North American College, Gregorian University. Uh, question about omission and inclusion. So I'm going to ask you about the most serious omission and the most important inclusion regarding your time in the seminary. So what would you say was not taught? This is the most serious omission. What would you say was not taught in the seminary that now looking back 30 years ordained that ought to have been taught? What was not taught that ought to have been taught? And then what was the most important inclusion? What happened in the seminary that was so significant that it has forged in you what it was you've needed to live out your mission faithfully. So the most serious omission, what wasn't taught that ought to have been taught, and the most important inclusion, what was it that happened in your seminary formation that has forged in you the gifts and graces you've needed to be faithful to live your mission today? Great question. So... So I say oftentimes when we're working with bishops and priests and lay leaders in our work, I, I think right now that the most serious omission was in one way or another, either implicitly or explicitly, um, I somehow got the message. Uh, don't know that I believed it, but I, I really don't believe it now. That, that we as 
ordained should never be vulnerable. Maybe I just say it that clearly. I, I, I don't think we were taught how to be vulnerable. I don't think we were taught the importance of vulnerability. I think we were taught, and um, again, implicitly or explicitly, depending upon situations, um, that great leaders are vulnerable and great men are vulnerable. And, so let's take, let's take a look ahead. at that word vulnerable. So when I think of the word vulnerable, I think have a willingness to come out into the open with areas in their lives that are not all together, that are not all uh, in control. Uh, there's an openness to uh, be drawn into relationships um, beyond a functional, like, so there's not just a negative side to vulnerability, there's a positive side. So when you say taught to be vulnerable, uh, what do you mean? Yeah, so it's literally like able to be wounded, right? And so I think it means everything from, um, um, in an appropriate way, bearing our scars. Mm -hmm. Like Jesus is vulnerable. Jesus shows his wounds. Jesus, Jesus doesn't hesitate to show his wounds. Jesus doesn't hesitate to show all his emotions. Um, the Lord sweats blood. He cries over Jerusalem. He reveals his pierced heart to Thomas. Um, I what I mean when I say that is um, great leaders uh, are able to be at one of the same time. It's yeah, strong and um, and genuinely human. Mm -hmm. So I'm not I'm not saying that we should be doing therapy from the pulpit. I'll give you an example. So I was sexually abused when I was a kid, and. Um, I don't even know when it started. I, I remember very clearly the day it ended, but I don't, don't remember when it started and it was from different people. I would never have thought of sharing that 30 years ago, maybe outside of with a spiritual director. Um, I share it all the time right now. And I share it because for a lot of reasons, um, but I, th I, I think it's, the, the church is in, I think, desperate need of learning how to be human again. I think that's actually one of the one of the most fundamental problems in the church. We we relate, excuse me, very functionally and transactionally to one another, often. Not always, but often. And uh you, you can't love what you don't know. And unfortunately, our our parishes more often than not are so big that we can't know each other and so it's no surprise that we often talk to each other and relate to each other the way that we do and i think it's incumbent on those who lead to let themselves be known that doesn't mean you got to know every intimate detail of my life but that's how that's one of the ways i want people to know me and i want because I, I'm, I'm also you know um self-knowledge hopefully helps us to grow in kind of like emotional intelligence. And so we're aware of how we come off. And I know one of the ways that I, uh, especially when I was younger, can come off is, is either um, cocky or arrogant or self-assured, um, which actually was just a, a mask for feeling woefully insecure because of what had happened to me as a child and thinking that I actually just didn't matter. So I, I masked that with, I just don't care if, I don't care what you think of me because I don't want to get hurt again. So for those, you know, who can come off that way to actually reveal, um, you know, I'm, I'm aware of that. And, and in fact, this is who I really am. And we all have masks and we all have wounds and we all struggle with things. And the Lord's in the, in the business of putting us back together and of using us to help heal each other. And nobody hears all together uh, can be very helpful. I think. Yeah. I, I just to confirm that. So I've been doing radio ministry for 18 years and 
uh, on Fridays, my wife, Carrie, is on with me. And um, when I bump into people or people contact me in whatever form and they talk about the radio program, almost without exception, they'll say, I love your program, especially Fridays with Carrie, because it's so genuine. It's so real. We are willing to disclose that this is the reality of what it is we're walking out right now, not it's all perfect and we're on the radio. Therefore, we're the teachers. We're up high and we'll condescend to share with you wisdom that hopefully one day you'll be able to get to where we are. And so having that sense of authenticity and genuineness is so very powerful because it makes you're a witness to a truth, not just someone who's a scholar of the truth. So yeah, I can, yeah, no, I appreciate that. I'm not, I'm, I'm really not interested in being a scholar of anything. I want to be conformed to him and, um, I'm I'm grateful for the education that I have and what I've been blessed to to learn in, in a variety of different ways. But man, I got a long a lot still to learn. I what I'm what I most want, especially as the culture gets less and less human, I want to try to model a way of being human. It's so essential. It's one of our apostolic values in our work. Like we give each other permission to be real. Like it's okay to not be okay. You know? So I think that's the biggest omission. All right, let me, uh, I'm going to dive into, I'm going to share, do you want to talk about the the greatest gift you received or a great gift? Because I've got yeah, a bunch know, more. I'll do it real quick. Um, right. it, so it wasn't something that was, it, it was something that came, it didn't come formally, it came just by being in Rome. Um, I think the biggest inclusion was the desire for magnanimity. Hmm. Um, being in the presence of the saints. Um, quite literally in the presence of the saints, you know, in the in the remains of the relics, in the presence of John Paul, as often as we were fortunate to meet him, um, it it roused ever more in me or confirmed ever more in me um, a desire to be great for God, not for me. Um, I could give a flip if anybody ever knows my name, but I I. I I deeply believe that every person has within them a desire to be great. Mm -hmm. And and the saints model for us what greatness looks like. That's beautiful. And, you uh, actually tapped right into a question of mine. Uh, the saint for our time, Padre Pio or Mother Teresa. Uh, saints help us, move us to accomplish our mission. Uh what would you propose as a saint that has helped you specifically move you to accomplish your mission? And then let that launch into Padre Pio or Mother Teresa. I'd say option C. And I think the saying is Joan of Arc. Really? I love it. Let's go. So it's interesting, right? So Joan, Joan's burnt the stake at, uh, at 19 years old, uh, 1431. Um, we know more about her perhaps than any other person who ever lived at that time. Mm -hmm. And we know so much about her because we have the transcript of her trial and then the transcript of her, um, like, oh, sorry, we burned you to death, uh, retrial. And so we have not only her words, but we have the words of those who knew her. So Jones is fascinating figure. So she's burned at the stake and yet she's not a martyr because she doesn't die for the faith. Um, it, it, it's, a, it's a strange case because it's so um, seemingly political. But the, the reason why Jones so significant to me is, um, so Jones, one of Jones' many famous lines, uh, when she embarks on the mission that the Lord gives to her, she was asked, aren't you afraid? And she says, no, I'm not afraid. God is with me. I was born for this. That is magnanimity. That's not pride. Um, that's magnanimity. And the reason why I think that's so significant is what we're constantly trying to drive home into every other person is that's not just true for Joan. That's true for you and for me, for every single person. Like I was born for right now. And you were born for right now. I'm not a historical accident. You're not a historical accident. 
Like God could have chosen in his providence for you to be alive at ninth century Guatemala, right? But he chose now in this country where you live and he, and he placed into you very particular gifts, just like he placed into Joan, very particular gifts. And he's placed every single one of us where we are with our, with our gifts, natural, supernatural, and he has a mission for us. And I don't think most Catholics know the mission. And the mission isn't to get out of here. The mission isn't to survive and get to heaven. You know, like heaven's the goal to be sure, but heaven, I don't think we understand what heaven is either. The mission is to do everything we can to cooperate with Jesus in what he began on Easter Sunday. And what he began on Easter Sunday was the recreation of this world, which he loves. And when he comes back, and he will come back, and it might be Tuesday, um, he's not going to take us away. He's going to make a new heaven and a new earth. And, you know, you and I are the same um, age where we, we used to sing that really bad song, um, Let Us Build the City of God, which is a really bad song because you can't build the city of God, but you can build for it. And we're supposed to. And I think the reason why Joan's such a significant saint for this day is because I think the struggle for a lot of disciples is how do I integrate my faith into my life other than just do it with integrity? And it's important to do it with integrity. But the mission isn't holiness. Holiness is really important. Holiness is something like the mission interiorly. In other words, like cooperating with the Holy Spirit to have all those places in my life, my mind, my patterns of speech, my thought, my actions, whatever, where the enemy's been reigning, I want the Spirit to, to lead me to surrender to those areas so that they're, they're now in Jesus' control, right? That's the mission interiorly. But there's a mission out there. And one of my favorite lines from C.S. Lewis is, um, the story of Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed in disguise and flesh, right? And he calls us all to engage in a great campaign of sabotage. That's the mission. And that makes people really nervous because we're rightly very concerned about language like that in our culture. But, you know, so like I would word that more, even more provocatively as Jesus calls us to go blow things up. Um, we just have to understand a couple of things. First of all, the enemy is the enemy, period, which is to say the enemy is not another race, another gender, another political party. No human being is my enemy. I might be theirs. They're not mine. They're just rebels to win, just like I was, and still can be, and just like you were, and still can be. Um, the enemy is Satan, period. People do wicked things. That, that's not what I'm saying. Of course they do. There's a lot of people doing wicked things right now. They're not the enemy. I want to win them, because Jesus died for the ungodly, which is all of us. And then we also have to remember what are the weapons. The weapons are truth and goodness and beauty and integrity and forgiveness and reconciliation. And the Lord wants to, and this is what Joan understood and what we need to understand. The Lord wants to send us out as doctors, as, as, as radio hosts, as, as attorneys, as politicians, as coaches. And he wants to put us into those areas so that by his grace, we can do everything we can to take what the enemy has bent and try to bend it back so that it's in conformity with how the Father created it to be. And it might cost me my life, and it might cost you yours, but it's worth it. That's the mission. Like, I was born to do that. And, and that's what you and I are sent out after every single Mass. Huh? Ite Misa Es. She is sent to do what? Yes, to evangelize, but it's more than evangelize. You know, Jesus says, um, teach them everything I have commanded you. Well, Jesus didn't just teach us how to pray. He taught us how to play, how to work, how to eat. He taught us about politics. He taught us about sex. He taught us about marriage. He taught us about friendship. He taught us about forgiveness. The task of the disciple is go into the world and make of the church an attractive and threatening um, icon of how the world will be one day when he returns and makes it all new. And, and that's what Paul did when he started his little churches. They were 
immensely attractive and very dangerous to the Roman Empire. And I don't think the church right now is either attractive or threatening to downright anybody in most places. Right, you actually lead me right into my next quote. I'm going to jump ahead about a century and a half, a little bit ahead of St. Joan of Arc to St. Catherine of Siena. And I'm going to put a twist on a very famous quote of St. Catherine's, which you could finish easily. Become who, who you are meant to be and you'll set the world on fire. Okay, I'm going to switch and say, respond to this one. Become fire and the world will become what it is meant to be. Is that true? And if so, how would you help Catholics to become fire so that the world will become what it is meant to be? Yeah, I think it's true. And, and, and it, I think it's especially appropriate today on the Feast of the Sacred Heart, right? So um, the Lord wants to kindle a fire on the earth, right? And the fire is the fire of charity. And, and you know, tragically, we, we reduce charity to sentiment. And, and that's not what charity is. Charity includes, but it's bigger than sentiment. It's bigger than feelings. I don't think Joan felt particularly good as she was being burned alive, right? I don't think Maximilian Colby felt particularly good as he's dying of starvation, taking the place of, of another inmate in Auschwitz. I think, I think the church had, so here's the problem. So there are a lot of things wrong right now in the culture, in the church, in the nation, in the world. The key to problem solving is to find the problem. What's the problem? Like, what's the fundamental problem with humanity? Well, it's, it's right here. It's the heart. So how does the heart get well? I mean, politics is very important. Can't fix my heart. Law is really important. It can't fix my heart. The only one that can fix my heart is, is God. And he, he fixes that in lots of ways, by the power of faith and by the power of the sacraments, especially, whereby my heart is hopefully ever more conformed to his heart. And so become fire, meaning what? Have your heart ever more conformed to the heart of Jesus. What are you going to do? Well, you, you're going you, to you're help heal the world. Why? Because the world's at each other's throats right now. And nobody can fix this except God, which is to say nobody can fix this except his bride. Because that's how God works in the world right now, is through his bride. The problem is the church is at each other's throats too. And so there is a, like everything's at stake. Like we, we have got to get well as the body of Christ, or we are not going to be able to answer the world's cry. But instead, the world is often, or the church rather, is oftentimes, I think, imitating the world. We demonize one another. We, we, you know, the charismatics demonize the traditionalists. The TLMers demonize the charismatics. You know, how dare you receive Jesus in the hand? How dare you tell me I have to receive him on the tongue? You know, how dare you do? We, we just act like the world. We got to stop doing that. And so if our hearts can, can ever bore, be conformed to the Lord's, if my heart can be ever more conformed to the Lord, then I'm going to be all the more able to go out into the world in which I live and to play my part in helping to reconcile the world, which is what God's sending us out to do by drawing people into an encounter with Jesus. People should walk into our parishes, people who are not Catholic, people who have been away from the church for a long time. They should walk into our parishes and they should look around and go, I'll be darned. These people really get it. Here's people who don't have anything in common. They, they, they drive different cars. They, they make different levels of income. They're every color under the rainbow. They have nothing in common. All they have in common is they know they owe everything to the man on that cross, and they have surrendered their lives to him, and they call each other brother and sister, and they lay down their lives for each other. And if people saw that, they'd be lining up in our churches. They don't see it. And because they don't, our churches are emptying. Or where they don't, the churches are emptying. Where they do, people are flocking. Yeah, I uh, 
uh, I was talking with my wife, Carrie, before the the interview and just saying, hey, you, you know, I've got a whole bunch of questions for Father John. What would you want him to talk about? And she's talked about the mag the magnetic quality of uh, holiness, that when you have a union of the faithful in love and God's dwelling in their midst, it is not only radiant, it's magnetic. You know, so there's a radiant quality to divinity when God is dwelling in our midst and there's a magnetic quality to it. And it was specifically connected to the work of evangelizing. She said, if there's something that holds me back from evangelizing, uh, it's not about talking about Christ, but it's talking about the bride of Christ, because where are they going to come? We're going to bring them to that parish. Are they going to see and flesh the one that we were so passionately talking about? And so that discrepancy between the Christ that we hopefully radiate because we've been set on fire and then the communities we bring them back to, it can be a, a real painful gap that we end up facing in our, in our work of evangelizing. Yeah, I couldn't agree more. I, I, I think, I, I think one of the, one of the tasks, one of the tasks in front of us, it's, and it's often, not always, but it's often because of things like our parishes are so big and most people in most parishes have actually never been evangelized. And they'll tell you that. Right. Like, do you have a friendship with Jesus? No, I'm Catholic. That's actually the wrong answer, but I understand what you're saying. Right. So they've been sacramentalized, not evangelized. So it's not surprising when when people come to our churches that they're often feeling like I'm just at a gathering like any other gathering in the world. It's just that there's a guy up there with vestments and there's some things that are happening. What we're talking about is a little different. I think that's why it's more and more imperative in the age that we're living in right now for evangelization to take place in the home and for us to understand that evangelization is really not going to happen in most parishes. It's going to happen in some. What happens in the parish should be I'm nourished by the sacraments. Hopefully I'm nourished by the word of God. Hopefully I'm equipped to go out on mission. But if maybe it's another way to say that would be I would I would first want to evangelize and bring people into my home where you're not going to get the sacraments to be sure but what you are going to get is you're going to get a taste of the body of christ and you're going to get it in a flawed way because i'm flawed and you're flawed but I, I want to try to at least invite you into a small community of of men and women who are diverse but who are serious about wanting to grow in conformity to Jesus and live in friendship with him and invite others into that friendship, convinced that we are, that that's the only way to live a genuinely authentic human life. So I'm going to invite you to my home and then I'm going to prepare you for what you're going to see in the parish. And I'm going to tell you that so, it's going to be disappointing. Yeah, that's so powerful. I think that, uh, so when Carrie and I talk about our married life and when we talk about marriage and family life, we say that, uh, you know, the family is the icon of the Trinity, right? That the family is, marriage is a communion of persons and uh, that is meant to reflect the, the Trinity as this mysterious, infinite, perfect communion of persons. And then I'll say kind of a dramatic statement. If you want to know what the Trinity is like, come and hang out with us in our home. And uh, like, that's your standard family. Yep. Your fam Your standard as a family ought to be, if you want to know what the blessed Trinity is like, Come and hang out with my family and you'll get your sense of it. You'll get a whiff of it. You'll have a, 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 a sense of you've encountered the living God because of how we are as a family. And so when I talk with Carrie about what brings me the greatest happiness as a family, it's not about accomplishments or stuff. It's about literally being able to be together enjoying each other in life-giving ways that is often manifest through play and laughter, mutual enjoyment, not stepping on top of each other, but just being together in life-giving ways. And we had a, a friend of my oldest daughter stay with us for um, just a couple of days. She was here in town for some, um, for a soccer game. And, um, and on her way out, she just said to me, she said, I want you to know that I have never experienced a family that enjoys each other 
as much as you all are just enjoyed each other at the dinner table, playing games, hanging out. So, you know, just being together. And, and I'm like, mission accomplished, right? Mission yeah. accomplished that if we can only foster that sense of let's enjoy each other because God can forge hearts that are open to each other and love each other. And you have that communion of persons. That's the goal. Yep. I, I love that. And and praise, praise be Jesus for the fact that she, she was able to see that in you guys. And, and I think, you know, from, from our perspective, that's what we're trying to do as a, as an apostolate when we're working with bishops and, and pastors and, and lay leaders is to model something. So I, I'm the only priest in, in Acts 29. Everybody else is a, a, is a married lay person. And we're very deliberate when we're, I mean, it's, so we're missionaries. We do life together. We love each other. We spend a lot of time with each other. We vacation with each other. We work hard together. We pray hard together. We laugh a lot. We eat a lot. We try to just do life. But when we're out, like we're increasingly mindful of the fact that we're we're trying to um, model something like a sub curriculum for clergy and lay faithful both, but especially to clergy to show them something like maybe going back to that you know what I was talking about the greatest omission of vulnerability. Like I want to I want to model for guys how do priests and lay people relate? How do lay people and priests relate? How do men and women relate? How do priests and women relate? Um, and because so often it's not healthy, you know? And so we've been out in lots of settings. We were doing a mission one time with a chancery and we went out to dinner one night. This was in kind of like the height of COVID. And so we were uh, we were eating outside in a tent, everybody right next to each other. We were just outside in the tent. And um, it turns out that the people in the chancery were actually in the same tent eating and somebody came up to us at the end of the night and says, you know, we've been watching you guys all night long. And we can't fathom doing what you do. You know, you guys poured into us all day. And now you're out um, laughing, talking, going at it, having fun. We get to the end of the day. We can't wait to get away from each other. And they just said, can you teach us how to live like that? Because we want to do that. And when we can, you know, just like to exactly your point, when we can, you know, mindful that we're all broken and flawed and screw up time and time again, but when we can live the way Paul lived and say, imitate me as I imitate Jesus. When we can have that as a desire and a goal well, then we're going to draw a lot of people to Jesus. Amen. All right. I, I, uh, I'm, I'm aware of time. I've got a couple other chunky questions here. And um, the church's mission. So you, am, you are focused on this is who you are. Help the church to fulfill its mission to evangelize, right? Um, there are many moments in mission. One of the moments that has been prominent in the last 35 years is apologetics, which can take two principal forms, a rational defense of the faith or a way of showing that our faith is reasonable to remove objections to the faith. And it's not a way of proving that the faith is true. So apologetics has been a gift from the late 80s until today as a way of fostering new uh, verve and, and vitality in the lives of so many disciples. So apologetics has been a great gift. And if you want to speak to the way that you've seen apologetics be a gift, I'm open to that. But I'm more interested in the way that you've seen apologetics be a hindrance. And, and I point to two different moments where apologetics not properly placed is a hindrance to the work of evangelization. And that is when apologetics gets confused with proclamation and apologetics gets confused with catechesis. So when apologetics is confused as evangelization, now we put the focus typically on the church or on or on proving that Christ is who he is and somehow thinking that's what the work of evangelization is. It's using apologetics as an attack with the faith rather than a defense of the faith. Or secondly, 
apologetics becomes the principal way of forming Catholics as disciples. So apologetics becoming catechesis. For instance, purgatory becomes taught in a way that you can show the scriptural basis, some historical moments, and you can identify the obstacles that people have and you can get rid of it. But people have no sense of, no sense of how that doctrine can take uh, take flesh in their lives, in their spirituality, regarding mercy, regarding cleansing, regarding devotion, and all of that. So apologetics is a gift in the in the the missionary life of the in the mission of the church in in today. But apologetics can also be a hindrance when it's used out of place. How would you respond to that? You know, I'd I'd emphatically agree. So I, I would say. You know, I heard somebody say said a years ago, and I think this is true. You know, there's there's kind of two doors by which people enter the church. There's the door of truth, and there's the door of beauty. And a number of people, to be sure, enter through the door of truth, which is kind of where apologetics fits. It's kind of the rational explanation of the faith, as you said. Um, incre increasingly so, it's people entering through the door of beauty. For a lot of reasons, not least of which is truth is not exactly the most interesting thing for most people today. Should be very interesting, but it's not. Beauty is. And um, the proclamation of the gospel has always got to go first. You know, so if there's one primary scripture in our work in Acts 29, it's Romans 116, you know, that the gospel is the power of God for salvation. And when Paul says that, there's so many things to rip apart there, but it's it's the 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 simple proclamation is power, not 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 the herald, not not the attractiveness of the herald. I mean, the the, the person matters obviously, but the news itself, the message itself, the events that the the gospel describes is power. It's explosive news, which brings healing to people. And the reason it brings healing is because it's so beautiful, because at the heart of the gospel is um, God has not just willed you into existence out of love. He's rescued you from this tyrant that we were talking about earlier, which means the heart of the gospel is this beautiful. You matter. You matter. You're seen. You're known. You're loved. And you're loved by the one that made the universe. That's the heart of the gospel. Everything else comes after that. And in, in, I think part of the challenge is because people, you know, again, today's the Feast of the Sacred Heart. And so we have this reading from 1 John, which we just fly through without any thought whatsoever that God is love. Nobody ever, ever said that. God isn't loving. You know, like you and I are loving every once in a while. You probably more than me. God is not loving. God is love that's two really different things that's who he is and he and he reveals it most fully by becoming flesh and pouring his life out for us not just for an atonement for our sins but in going to battle to rescue us from this trafficker people don't know that and in, i think it's cardinal Contlamesa who said one time you know you can't bend cold steel you have to warm it first once you warm iron or steel, you can manipulate it. You can move it all around. You can do all sorts of things with that. And he, he makes the point to say, most of us have really cold hearts. And, and despite all the facades and all the things that we hide behind, what we're all desperate to know is that I'm loved. And the message of the gospel is that simple. You're loved. So start there. You're loved. Might you have to change? Yeah, we'll get to that. You're loved. God cares about you. The cross is not a reward for great behavior. You know, you're loved. And until somebody has been warmed by that in the way that only the Holy Spirit can, apologetics, though valuable, actually might be detrimental because I'm going to try to bend cold steel and it might snap. So I think the imperative for most people right now, for everybody, the imperative is always preach the gospel first. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, what we're going to do, and it's and it's very tempting right now in the culture to go after all sorts of 
um, moral issues. But if you go after moral issues without having first evangelized and warmed somebody's heart, you're actually going to make them angry and you're going to drive them away. I want to get, I want to dive into this a bit more because my experience, this is anecdotal and it's more about attitudes is that those who have come into the faith through the doorway of apologetics and who lead with apologetic modes of expressing the faith in moments of evangelization or catechesis often are in a position of controlling or mastery over the faith. Like ask me a question and I can master it. I can um, manipulate around by giving you correct theological answers. But what's often missing is that moment of vulnerability, of surrender, of letting Jesus be the redeemer because I needed to be redeemed. And now my heart is on fire because I've been brought into the fiery heart of Christ. That that relational dimension where we are his and he is mine is hidden, if not absent, because the faith was never brought to them in that way. And so they've been able to live the faith in a controlling attitude. I don't know if that's too strongly stated, but that is often when I get frustrated with those who lead with an apologetic mode of living their Catholic faith, it, it's bleeding beyond the moment that it's supposed to be in. And, and that's often what it's connected to. Yeah, I would, uh, I would again, wholeheartedly agree with you. I think um, what, what, what that often, what often happens is we're, if I'm, if I'm preoccupied with truth and, and that's not to say that truth doesn't matter. Of course it matters. But if I'm preoccupied with that, I, I'm it's, more well, we're preoccupied with truths, uh, not yeah, with truth. the truth, right? Right. Who is a person? Yeah. What can happen is I'm I'm not really listening to you. I'm I've heard the topic, and now I'm going to prove the topic. Whereas what we want to do in in discourse, especially mindful of the fact that most people that we're talking to have genuinely never heard of Jesus, they don't know him. I need to have one ear to you and one ear to him. And this is hard. You know, this is an art. And, and you know, as you were talking, I think one of the, uh, one of the things that um, came to mind is um, um, Pope Francis gave a spectacular reflection to the bishops of Brazil back in 2013, where he's reflecting on Emmaus. And he said, um, he said, I'd, I'd like to ask us a question today. Are we still a church capable of warming hearts? A church capable of leading people back to Jerusalem, of bringing them home? And, and I don't know that we are. I mean, this, this is, you know, accompany, it's, accompaniment has become one of those buzzwords, which now is kind of like almost meaningless, you know? But accompaniment is like, I, I'm very clear on what the goal is. The goal is I want to bring you into the heart of Jesus so that you can encounter the Father's love. But I have to be willing to be very patient because you're not a problem to be fixed. You're a person to be loved. And you probably, living in this day and age, not only have a lot of things that are confusing, but you've probably been hurt really badly, including probably by the church in some way or other, if nothing else, by, by, by a Christian or somebody who has, uh, you know, worn a collar or whatever. So we got a lot of bruised reeds. And so are we really willing to like roll up our sleeves, do the long work of walking with people, not just for the sake of walking with them, but walking with them so as to bring them into the Lord's embrace. And in order to do that, I, it might take some time. I, I heard somebody once, Abigail Favalli, I'm, I'm, you've probably read her. She's got this great book on um, gender and whatnot. She used to teach out in Portland. Now she's at Notre Dame. There's a great book called The Genesis of Gender. and uh, But in there, she, she uses an image for accompaniment, which I find very helpful. She says, you know, a, accompanying somebody is kind of like walking a switchback. You're just going... Oftentimes you're going sideways. You're, you're you're always ascending, but it's not always as clear. Like, 
we're actually going somewhere, but yet we have to be in it for the long haul. And Jesus is in it for the long haul with us. We need to be with each other. Nice. I'll respond to this quote. God is easily pleased, but he is not easily satisfied. So I'll, I'll turn it back to the Sacred Heart today. So there's an antiphon in the office. My son, give me your heart. Or my daughter, give me your heart. So he's easily pleased because uh, there's nothing you can do to win God's love. Like the fact that you exist, you exist, I exist because he loves me. And he always loves me, even when I walk away from him. But he wants more for me. And he wants more for me, not, not because he's demanding. Like God's not an egotist, but I think a lot of us think of God as an egotist. The only reason God would want all of my heart, which means to have him first and then everything else afterwards, is because that's good for me. It, it's good for me to love the one who is love above all things. And then to let his love flow through me into others, because if it's not his love flowing through me into others, um, I'm going to actually end up hurting people. So it's, you know, as a good father, you say to your children, hey, you really shouldn't run out in the in the road. And, and, and I'm telling you not to do that um, because I'm a really cruel dictator. It's like, no, I don't want you to get run over. You know, God, God wants me to surrender everything to him. And to let him guide my life, because it's only in doing that that I'll actually find fulfillment. And he wants me fulfilled. Yeah, yeah, I love that. That I mean, God has so much more for us than we can ask or imagine, right? He wants to just stretch yep. our vessel to fill us to overflowing, and we settle for less. It's the whole mud pie story from C.S. Lewis, C.S. right? Lewis. The weight exactly. of glory. Yeah. So. Father John Ricardo, thank you. You've been extraordinarily generous with your time. I really appreciate it. Thanks so much for being with me today. Great being with you, brother. Thanks. Always look forward to the next wrestling match. If you're open to it, we'll do another one. I'm open. All right, great. Nice.